on the University of Nottingham site. I'm sure it was very welcome on her part because she's our daughter. So it created more opportunities for her to be visiting home. <laughs> we would call her one of our diasporas. It is Professor Juliet Tondana. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and sirs. Now, I'll quickly ask Dr. Garwe to introduce our facilitators. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Gotti. Uh, I will request the uh, facilitators to introduce themselves, uh, starting with our keynote presenter, uh, Prof. Oh, thank you. My name is Saber Ojeng of Kateri. I'm at the University of South Africa. Good morning. Good morning. Did you bring what you said? So here is our keynote presenter, uh, the next facilitator. Uh, hello, good morning. I'm Tom Hill from the British Embassy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hadiza Kiri Abdurrahman, and I'm from Bishop Brewster's University in, in Lincoln, in the UK. Thank you. My time is up now. I was just warming a seat. <laughs> you all see from your program, Director of Ceremonies is uh, only Emeritus Professor, Professor Nguadi Bebe. So I'm heading over the mic to him. I'm sure he will now start by introducing the high table here. Then thereafter, he will proceed with the program. What a weighty job <laughs> for somebody who is breathless. Uh, I was rushing to catch up with the meeting before it could start. And I'm happy I did so. I caught up uh, with the whole function before it could go too far in my absence. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, I'm the chairman of Zimche, and I suppose this is why I'm being honored with this task uh, of introducing the high table and uh, produce, uh, proceeding with the whole thing. Uh, where shall I start? Let me start with the list. <laughs> <laughs> We are now my colleague and friend who work together at Simche. Uh, you are here, not in your own capacity, I believe. I'm told you are here uh, representing our director, Mrs. Simbut. Most welcome. Uh, quite right now, I do have the list in going upwards. <laughs> Uh, next, I have my own uh, respectable now uh, student uh, who, is, who, is, who has been catapulted to, the, uh, to this height of uh, being the CEO of Zimche, and that is Professor Jimbo, Peter Jimbo. Uh, he is our CEO and uh, we work together. He doesn't work under me, we work as equals uh, with his chair. You are most welcome. Uh, 
I then go to the extreme end of the uh, desk uh, I table. Ladies and gentlemen, again, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our permanent secretary, uh, uh, Professor. Professor Chabwira. He is not only permanent secretary, but we have had the pleasure of working together uh, as members of the Council uh, of Zimche. So he knows the system so well. Uh, he has been Vice Chancellor himself of Africa University and therefore uh, he is very well acquainted with the system of higher education and I think this is why he was picked up by His Excellency uh, to be our permanent secretary. Uh, now I go to the height of the high table and come to our Honorable Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, Professor Dr. Amon Murubira. Uh, we have worked together, he has been a colleague for many years, and uh, after so many achievements uh, as an academic, uh, he was then selected uh, to lead our higher education. education. He is our honorable minister. I'm sure we will learn a little more. Well, let me start by by saying good morning to you all. The honorable Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development, Honorable Professor Dr. Amon Muwira, our Director of Ceremonies and Chairman of the Zimbabwe Council for Higher Education, Professor Ngwabi Bebe, The Deputy Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science, and Technology Development, um, who is not here with us this morning, but is listed here, Honorable Raymo Machingura. I read his name so that you remember we have a Deputy Minister. The CEO of Zimche, Professor Kujineta Peter Jimbo, and all members of the Zimche. Uh, Council present here, Your Excellency, the Ambassador to Zimbabwe, the British Ambassador to Zimbabwe, and other Embassy officials who are here present, esteemed Vice Chancellors of our state universities and private universities, the Executive Director of the Research Council of Zimbabwe, Mrs. Susan Muzite. Our distinguished scientist who is in our midst, Professor Chetanga, the director of ZIMSEC, Dr. Lazarus Nembaware, directors from the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development, and other senior government officials who are here present, representatives of principals of polytechnics and teachers' colleges, the Chairman of the Registrar's IHTE Policy Drafting Task Force, Dr. Thomas Bebe from Chinoy University of Technology and other registrars here present. Our keynote speaker from UNISA, Professor Sabelo Ngovu Gacheni. Workshop facilitators who are from local and outside of Zimbabwe. The University Academic Staff Representative, Mr. Mbika. The Student Representative, who is from Gwanda State University, SRC. Uh, 
President Mr. Darrell Nyanga, members of the media present, our distinguished workshop organizers, Professor Juliet Tongana from the University of Nottingham, and Dr. Evelyn Garwe, the Deputy CEO from Zimche, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the workshop on the presentation and discussion of the framework for internationalization of higher and tertiary education, IHTE, in Zimbabwe. Internationalization is an opportunity that, if properly harnessed in an organized and harmonized way, can bring significant benefits for Zimbabwe as a nation and for individual institutions in line with Education 5.0 and the National Vision 2030. The workshop is a continuation of our never-ending quest towards strengthening the higher and tertiary education sector to better serve our communities and to develop our country and its people. On the 3rd of July 2018, we gathered here for the All Stakeholder Workshop, wherein it was resolved that the ideas of stakeholders be compiled into a framework document and that is the reason why we are here today. Cognizant of that, A, the expectations of our students and stakeholders are changing. B, what we can do is limited not only by the resources we have or the resources we don't have. And C, the international higher education landscape is also changing. That is, higher and tertiary education institutions need broad strategies for academic cooperation, such as joint degrees, exchange programs, support for capacity building, joint research projects, participation at international platforms, both physically and virtually overseas campuses, as well as distance learning programs. And agreeing that Zimbabwean institutions need, A, to attract more talent from the diaspora and around the world, B, to engage in cooperation with the international institutions, and C, to find innovative ways of raising income. The workshop participants so the internationalization of higher and tertiary education framework document as an important guide to the nation and its institutions. My ministry has an important role to play in identifying opportunities and responding to emerging challenges in the higher and tertiary education sector. It is our combined effort at all levels that will enable us to ensure quality higher education in Zimbabwe. We all have a part to play in ensuring that our students are educated and equipped with the skills they need to succeed on a rapidly changing employment market. There is no single approach to internationalization. It can vary widely depending on the context and depending on the institution. What is important is that all higher and tertiary education institutions realize that they have to position themselves one way or another in the face of globalization and are guided by <coughs> national policy imperatives. I know all of us are here working very hard in this particular direction. Today's workshop is therefore proof that we are moving in that direction. I look forward to the stimulating debates that will come out of this event. Once again, allow me to say 
welcome to all of you to this very important workshop. Thank you. That we must therefore speak about a decontextualized knowledge within all locus of enunciation. And I remember one of the colleagues who came to present at, at UNIS, I'm not sure whether Prof. Zimbo was still there, presented a very interesting paper which says theory from Norway. <laughs> a theory from Norway. In other words, we can no longer continue to think from a place. And what is emphasized is the issue of partnerships and the co-production of knowledge. Fair and fine, I think a good case is being made. But yes, I'm saying that when we think about these things, we need to always to have all our eyes open. One of the issues is that when we speak about the global economy of knowledge, the problem is that the center has not fallen in the first place. The Europe and the North America, they remain as a center in the domain of knowledge. And I will try to demonstrate how. There is, there is even a more problematic issue, the intellectual division of labor. The intellectual division of labor, I've been doing my work, most of my work from Africa, from South Africa, from the global south. And my experience is that we spend so much energy doing hunting and gathering of raw data. <laughs> we spend really a lot of time hunting and gathering of raw data to the extent that sometimes we reduce ourselves to native informants. <laughs> there is no problem with gathering raw data, but the problem is when you gather raw data, but theory is still formulated from somewhere. Mm. And then you consume it voraciously from that somewhere. <laughs> and I think there is then a problem there, which Nottingham and the universities here, they need to deal with that question. We can't avoid it. We need to really reflect on it. And it comes sometimes as a badge of honor. <laughs> the badge of honor, I'm a Marxist, I'm a Gramscian, I'm a Foucaultian, I'm a Deridian. In other words, the people of the Global South having these same names, <laughs> which then authorizes them in the domain of knowledge. And I think we need to be careful about that. <laughs> One of, of our colleagues from Puerto Rico who is based in the US, he always says the problem in the knowledge domain is this dead white men of five countries. UK is mentioned. <laughs> Sorry about that. France is mentioned, Italy is mentioned, the US is mentioned. Those five countries, he says, if you look at social theory, it actually comes from these five countries. Basically, across the world. People generally, if you go to a sociology department, they will come from either Germany or what. And then you are saying, the problem is even deeper than that is men, dead men of five countries. Even the women of those five countries are not prominent. So it means, therefore, when we are thinking about internationalization, we need also to think about who produces knowledge and from where. I'm not sure about here in, in, in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, it seems we still we are open to people can publish anyway. But in South Africa, we don't do it that way. In South Africa, you must know where to publish. In South Africa, you must know where to publish if you want. And again, we also, universities, beyond the academic freedom, I think universities need to think deeply about also academic democracy. Particularly when we speak about academic democracy, we're talking about dehierarchization of representation within the university the university governments. As I said, I will adopt the positionality of a discussant. My two sisters just presented now about 
the theory of change, and I think I will need to comment on that one as well. The theory of change, immediately I read about it, I thought about two visions of the future. Two visions of the future, and we need to be very careful which one we follow. The first one is the incomplete modernity. Incomplete modernity. It is a vision. If you go to people like um, Habermas, they still think the problems of the world is because of incomplete modernity. And when they then speak about incomplete modernity, the problem is that it is still crafted within the post-enlightenment linear notions of social, social evolution, progress, salvation, civilization, modernization, development and emancipation with the Europe and America as the templates. And this, this is, I think we need to be very careful because the type of education we then cascaded from this type of thinking, it tended to evade the mental universes of the other worlds. And when we say it invades the mental universe, is to try to change Africa into something else which is not. And the consequences of that is what we are facing today. People like me, people like all of us here, who then lost confidence in their names, who lost confidence in their cultures, who lost confidence in their histories, who lost confidence in their languages, and who fundamentally lost confidence in themselves. And when we are thinking about reconfiguring the universities, we need to think about how do we move from this dismemberment to rememberment. And I think we need to put it at the center of our internationalization. But the second, the second uh, vision, which I think every time we think about the incomplete <coughs> modernity, we also need to think about incomplete decolonization. And we need to be clear, do we go for the incomplete modernity or we go for the incomplete decolonization. And I'm thinking that the incomplete decolonization in simple and straightforward <coughs> ways it becomes a movement to remember and to rehumanize. To remember and to rehumanize. And when we internationalize we want to be part and parcel of a common family. And that cannot be done without remembering those who have been pushed out and rehumanizing those who have been dehumanized. So it will be important for us to think about those two. But at the same time, when we're thinking in the way we're thinking now, Cabral always tells us that we must always think with our feet on the ground. And what does that mean, to think with our feet on the ground? Having been trained as a historian, I think we must always, when we're thinking about internationalization, we must think within the context of the lessons from history. And I will try to talk about three instructive moments in history, which are very important for us as we think about internationalization. It is not something new. That's, that's, what, that's what I will say. It is not something new. It depends which one are we going to go with. Remember that prior to colonization, Africa was the leading center of learning. Mm -hmm. And the people were coming to Africa to learn. They were coming to Al Hazar University in Cairo. They were coming to Karain University in Fez in Morocco. They were coming to Sangore University in Timbuktu in Mali. So universities were international. Those universities were international. That's why we say even the Greeks. People from Greece learned in Egypt. In other words, it was once a center of knowledge. And we can't just throw away that history. But the second moment, which is also important, historically speaking, is the colonial moment. The colonial universities. Colonial universities, particularly the colleges which were given in Africa, they were international in a particular way. So we need to be careful about that international. The minister spoke about University College of Rhodesia being a college of the University of London. Why don't we call that internationalization? We, want, we seem to want to, to create colleges again somewhere else. What is it that we are going to change that it won't be actually colonial? In other words, 
it won't be permeated by asymmetrical power relations. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we then think about even the experiments. Colonialists looks like they were more daring than us. In East Africa, there was a, a University of East Africa, which encompasses Nairobi, Makerere, and Dalasa, a federal university. And that was created by colonialism. A prof paper will remember the BLS universities, which again, they were federal in structure. And what lessons do we learn from that? As we, we seem now to be going back the same route, perhaps as independent people than as colonized people. And the third moment, which I think is important for us to, to reflect on, is our African nationalist uh, a moment. I remember my good friend, Paul Thierry Zeleza always says that is the proudest moment in African history, the moment of decolonization. And what lessons do we learn from there? One of the key issues which emerged from that was that there was this idea of one nation, one university. And that's how the, the, then the East African Federal University was cut into another one for Tanzania, another one for Uganda, another one for, for Kenya. And the purpose was that universities by then according to the nationalist project, they were supposed to fulfill particular issues. Nation building, state making, was one of the, the projects. They needed to play a role in that. Creating national identity was supposed also to be driven by the universities. And the issue of resolving the socioeconomic problems became part of the university. And by then, they were speaking about a developmental, African developmental university a university which actually drives development. And as we are thinking about internationalization, how do we balance between the imperatives, the nationalist deliberation, decolonial imperatives, and the internationalization? I think it's important that we think that way. And I remember that by 1967, the Association of African Universities was pushing this idea that we need African universities. And they actually defined what they meant by an African university. They said, that is in 1967, the truly African university must be one that draws its inspiration from its environment. Not a transplanted tree, but growing from a seed that is planted and nurtured in the African soil. And um, I thought about this definition when the minister was talking about heritage based. That we'll need really to then connect those, those dots. And this issue of um, internationalization at the center of it has always been this very problematic issue of standards. The question of standards. And again, that question is not a new one. When Julius Nyerere became the Chancellor of the University of East Africa in 1963, he actually reflected on that challenge. And this is what he said. He said that there are two possible dangers facing a university in a developing nation. The danger of blindly adoring mythical international standards, which may cast a shadow on national development objectives. And the danger of forcing our university to look inwards and isolate itself from the world. So he was reflecting on this, this issue of keeping a balance. al Mazuri went even further agree and disagree with him, he was saying a university has to be politically distant from the state, and I don't think the minister will agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> the university has to be politically distant from the state. Secondly, a university has also to be culturally close to society. I think we agree on that. And then he went further to say a university has to be intellectually linked to the wider scholarly and the scientific values of the world of learning. And I think that's where the internationalization actually comes in. But we are now at a fourth moment. And the fourth, the fourth moment, for lack of a better word, is this imaginary of a globally networked university. A globally networked university. And I think that's where our energies are now, how to create that university which is globally networked 
which actually takes seriously the whole issue of, of globalization. But there are many other pitfalls there. Because if you package the university as a corporation, you package the university like a commercial, like the, the Dutch East India Company, if, if you like, then it will see the way it is a mega market to be taped. But this is important, while it is important, we need also to say, but what type of knowledge are we supposed to produce by that globally networked uh, university? But the case for internationalization needs no agreement. It's a necessity. We will need to do it. But when we are doing it, we need to do it with both eyes open. That would be my that would be my my my, my, my simplest submission. We need to do it with both eyes open. Because there is this strong argument which says there's something called the global economy of knowledge. And that global economy of knowledge argument is used to justify internationalization. And the argument within this idea of a global economy of knowledge is that the idea of center periphery no longer applies. And that we must now think as people belonging to a village, what we call a global village. And then, if we're thinking that way, we must take cognizance of the dynamics and the turbulence, but we must not fall into the problem of dichotomies. That's what that argument says. And there is a recent book uh, entitled Knowledge and the Global Power, Making New Sciences in the South, which is published last year. And in this book, and I think I need to quote this one, this is what they say. There is a widespread idea that we live in a knowledge society, an information society, or a technological society. Yet, in the fields of research, there is also an idea that the disciplines we work, with, we work in and the concepts we work with do not come from any particular place in that society. They are just in the air, so to speak. And then, this takes us to then when we are thinking about the global economy of knowledge. I am privileged this morning to introduce to you our guest of honor, Professor Dr. Amon Murwira, who all of you, because you come from academia, are aware is a professor that we all know. A professor in aerospace and observation, satellite remote sensing, and geoinformation science, and global navigation systems. Unmanned area of vehicles, technology applications, and geospatial intelligence for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Professor Muwira holds a PhD from the University of Wageningen and the International Institute of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation ITC in the Netherlands. Professor Mugira, I'm told, was one of the most eminent students at ITC. And his thesis was rated as one of the best in Europe at the time of his graduation. <laughs> Professor Mugira, apart from being a distinguished academic, he has also sat on a number of boards of various organizations, and I cannot mention all of them here except to say the Research Council of Zimbabwe, the Civil Aviation Authority of Zimbabwe, where he was vice chairman, and he was chairman of the Forestry Commission, and the Minerals Marketing Corporation of Zimbabwe, and the Mining Promotion Corporation of Zimbabwe, and of course, the Zimbabwe, the University of Zimbabwe Council. When His Excellency the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, Dr. Idi Mnangagwa, appointed him to become the Minister 
of this ministry, he charged him with a very important task, which is to transform our higher and tertiary education system so that it can respond to the needs of the nation. That is the assignment that he was given. And in discussion with His Excellency, that's how he came up with Education 5.0, which many of you now are aware of. And he has been running with Education 5.0 with such great passion. I remember one person said, when a man or a woman is burning with passion, people will come from afar to watch them burn. <laughs> Indeed, it is my honor and privilege this morning to call upon our Honorable Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development, Professor Dr. Amu Mugira, to come to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tabira, for those kind words. I'm very humbled to be here um, to share issues on the internationalization of our higher and tertiary education in Zimbabwe. And um, <clears throat> I want to start uh, by saying Director of Ceremonies and Chairman of the Zimbabwe Council for Higher Education. Wanono comes good. Professor Emeritus Wabi Bebe, the Deputy Minister of Higher and Teacher Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development in Absentia, Honorable Remo Machingura, uh, the Permanent Secretary, our Professor Fanu Takwira, and the CEO of Zimche, uh, Professor Kujineza Peter Kimbo, and all members of Zimche here present. Your Excellency, the British Ambassador to Zimbabwe, represented here by Mr. Tom Hill, uh, esteemed Vice Chancellors of our state universities as well as our independent private universities. The Executive Director of the Research Council of Zimbabwe, Mrs. Muzite, and the whole RCZ that she has brought. Um, Director of ZIMSEC, uh, Dr. Lazarus Nimbaware, who is also Chairman of the uh, Higher Education Examination Council. Directors from my ministry, representatives of principals of Polytechnics and Teachers' Colleges, I'm happy you are here, and the Chairman of the registrars, uh, the internationalization, higher and tertiary education framework, uh, drafting task force, uh, Dr. Thomas Berebe from CAT and all other university registrars. Our keynote speaker, I'm happy to see you and uh, thank you for agreeing always to be with us, uh, Professor Savelo Dofu we, we are very happy to have you here, and um, we are always humbled that you agree to come. Our workshop facilitators who are from local universities and outside of Zimbabwe, um, the university academic staff representative, Mr. Mbika is here, I don't see Mr. Mbika, and uh, our student representative who is also with at Kwanda State University, SRC President, Tare Onyanka. Members of the media, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm really humbled to be here. And I just want to start very seriously by saying the state of any nation is um, positively, to positively correlated with the state of its higher and tertiary education system. If, you, if the state of uh, higher and tertiary education is bad, Normally, the economy is bad, and it's as simple as that, that um, our higher tertiary education system is a driver 
of what we should do and what we should not do. Once there is no correlation between what the nation does and what universities do, that's where we are labeled. When universities are then, universities are then labeled ivory towers, it means they, are, they do something there and we do something there, uh, which is exactly what we don't want. We want a higher and tertiary education system that is ingrained within the national and the international development agenda. And we are saying higher and tertiary education must bring leadership. And I just want to quote uh, Professor Mandilu Mulkuni here by saying leadership is based on, first of all, you have to love what you do and you have to love who you lead. And we call that love, peace, prosperity and happiness continuum, where we are saying without loving what we do, without loving whom we work with, without loving habitats where we stay, which is Zimbabwe, which then is Africa, which is then the world in which we are citizens, we are likely to be victims of selfishness, hatefulness and confusion. And we are saying higher tertiary education is the one that is to remove all of this. We are committed to make sure that our higher tertiary education system must have two things. One, purpose. Two, benefits. If an institution has no purpose, it basically has no purpose to exist. If a system has no purpose, it therefore means it has no purpose to exist. And uh, it must have benefits, because what we must always say is that we are, planned, we are plowing so much resources into this institution, and what are we benefiting from it? It cannot be for fun. We don't, we might have fun in having an education, but uh, while we are having an education, but we don't educate people for fun. We do that for serious issues that I've talked about, for love, for peace, for prosperity, for happiness. That's all what we need in life. And all this must come from the production of goods and services. Our universities must necessarily produce goods and services. We are saying we are departing from a model whereby universities are talk shops. And people say, let me be free to think about what I want to think, and it has nothing to do with you. If it has nothing to do with me, then that institution has nothing to do with me as well. So basically that means it's a useless university. It's a useless system. So we are saying all universities must necessarily produce goods and services because basically we can look at our universities as consisting in terms of their outputs of two channels of outputs. One is the services, which are mainly the, uh, the law, humanities, and so forth and so on. But some are for products which are tangible. But these things cannot be uh, exclusive because goods and services, actually goods lead the way. So we can say we are doing a project on microphones and I want to know what is the legal basis of the microphones. I also want to know what is the social relevance of the microphone and I also want to know what is the, the engineering aspect of the microphone. So education is a wall, and normally people divide themselves into faculties, but that's for convenience. But what we are looking for is the object which must lead to prosperity by the production of goods and services. If an education doesn't do this, uh, then I don't know what it is there for. It must industrialize. Education must industrialize. On a world stage, we know very well that Silicon Valley is a product of um, Stanford University. What we know is that while the whole world was uh, were using universities as places for fun, the United States of America in 1891 started the MIT and they started industrializing using their universities. And nobody knew why the United States was so sustainable. And up to now, so sustainable because it's a knowledge-based economy and that knowledge is translated into goods and services. Europe followed later. 
after the Second World War. But I'm sure that we were following the example, a very simple example of saying, why do I go to university? What is that thing for? Uh, some people say, ah, oh, no, leave us alone. It, no, we can't leave you alone. It's not possible. We'll leave you alone in your thoughts, but we'll not leave you alone in the trajectory. Because if the trajectory is wrong, we are bound to intervene because you work with stakeholders. And this is the time that universities exist for people, not to say, you, we come here, you come here and we teach you what we want to teach. No. You teach what we all want to know. The existence of any higher tertiary education institution, therefore, must be premised on the purpose and benefits it provides. In essence, it must be premised on the goods and services it provides. It must be based on the industry it provides. Otherwise, it just irons it out of existence itself. Goods and services must be produced in industries emanating from the work of our higher and tertiary education institutions. What that means is that we support the existing industry if it does exist, but we also create new industries. Higher and tertiary education institutions must industrialize this nation, must industrialize Africa, must be able to industrialize the world. We are world citizens, and therefore, we must contribute to this world. This is a duty. And however, for them to do so, for this institution to do so, our higher education is to shake off the yoke of producing a worker, not an industrialist. Our aim is to avoid confusion of why universities exist. Our national vision in Zimbabwe is that we attain an upper middle income economy and even exceed it. Uh, as pronounced by His Excellency the President, uh, Dr. Idim Nangago, this is our national strategic intent. Our national strategic intent is to eradicate poverty. To eradicate poverty by bringing prosperity through uh, love, uh, tolerance, and as well as progress in what we do. If we have to reach this national strategic intent, it means we must have a capability. Capability is the driver of intentions. You might have as bright intentions as you might want, but if you don't have capability, it's a pipe dream, right? I've someone say, oh, oh, we have to do this, we must have this. And um, it was my students, and I told them, tomorrow, tomorrow, I want to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Then they laughed. I said, why are you laughing? He says, our qualification, we're 24 universities with 24 different systems. And we said, no, 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 no. We have to have a national qualification framework. So that's why we have now the national qualification framework. So that we know what is a BSc civil engineering degree. It should not be a BSc civil engineering degree from there, from there. In Zimbabwe, it must be comparable so that we are able to say these are the core courses and people can specialize uh, 30 to 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent, but 70 percent to 80 percent overlap so that we know what it means. And then we can internationally benchmark that with all our most developed universities and be able to see that we are in the family of universities internationally before we can even talk about internationalization. So now we have structured instrument 132, uh, which makes it compulsory for the national, Zimbabwe National Qualification Framework, and uh, we expect that to happen. What we say is that this year, uh, and I agreed with Vice Chancellors that let's get our house in order with Zimche, uh, under Zimche guidance, and let's make sure that all courses with good bodies of skill, good bodies of knowledge, which are cross comparable, let's do all that and let's our, start our new undergraduate programs in August. All of us at the same time, private and public, so that we are able then to move and have an interoperable credit transfer system. I know Europe at, the, at this moment is in the process of doing their Bologna process, but we can be faster than that. So we believe that using the Zimbabwe National Qualification Framework, we are really able to make the education attractive and be able to cooperate with our counterpart universities in the UK and be able to really run systems that are of international standard. 
Without this, internationalization becomes a pipe dream. So how can you come to a confused people? So as we say, no confusion. The other issue is, as I said, the philosophical foundation whereby we say, let's be specialists in things that are around us, using the most advanced knowledge, but basing it, if you say, I want to do phytochemistry, but um, I mean, the, 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 the vegetation that I have to use is the one that I trained with at the University of Alberta, of Alberta which is uh, the maple tree. There are no maple trees here. But phytochemistry is phytochemistry. So what we are saying is that all your fruits, all your juices, and so forth, juices are juices, right? You cannot compete with Italy on grapes. Here, there's marula fruit. Do marula fruit, use the same chemist chemical methods, but sometimes because we are so uh, ingrained in the past, we don't contribute to the world but as I said, don't try to be like me because then I will not interact with you. Because if you are me, there's no need for interaction because I'm talking to me. So the world is waiting for Zimbabwe to talk for itself so that they can interact with Zimbabwe. If you are like England, you are boring to England. Very boring. Because they know you are them. So why are you interacting with them? Maybe Germany will interact with you. But maybe they will not, because you are far away. They will interact with England instead. So all what we're trying to say is that we have to be able to be special in a certain way so that we can provide the tapestry in this world for meaningful interactions. So this is what we are saying by the heritage-based philosophy. So with no plan nor vision, we cannot go anywhere. We have a vision and we have to plan for Zimbabwe in higher and tertiary education. Education 5.0 is our design. We are making a Zimbabwe higher and tertiary education system that conforms to international best practice. That's why we benchmark ourselves. That's why we are working with world-renowned universities, including the University of Nottingham, but uh, with unique and specific application and relevance to Zimbabwe's development and aspirations. Our ambition is to transform Zimbabwe so higher and tertiary education sector into a multi-billion dollar industry. Our higher and tertiary education institutions should rapidly move away from being cost centers to become revenue generating centers. From industrialization, not necessarily from student fees. We have conceptualized the Study in Zimbabwe program with the intention to make Zimbabwe the regional hub and beyond of higher and tertiary education. Higher and tertiary education has become exportable commodity, an exportable commodity to the world over. I was just reading about Australia, and uh, Australia's uh, fourth largest export is higher education. Mm -hmm. So, the government of Zimbabwe is fully behind the internationalization of higher and tertiary education. Several initiatives have already been taken in this regard. For example, revision of the student visa fees, which we are working on, and uh, it's almost there. Uh, the human sector told me it's almost there, they had a beautiful meeting. We started this, and all these problems started when we were trying to solve the problem of Africa University. That's when we discovered, oof, these people are suffering um, in terms of how they are handling the international students. So we said we'll solve it in total mm -hmm. and make sure that our visa regime is favorable and that our students get a visa and then it lasts during their time of study. But of course, when they fail, and if they are said go home, then they go home. But we make sure that they are able to stay during the duration of their study. <laughs> this will be finalized, of course, but the Minister of Home Affairs is very happy to just implement it. For, so we also will be offering scholarships to international students, offering them half of their, of their fees, and to say, okay, these fees, don't worry about accommodation we'll give you. Worry about tuition. So these are the issues that we are talking about. So, and we are changing the student visa renewal period to only once for the whole study duration. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the government shall assist in the recruitment of foreign students through establishing internationalization structures, 
such as partnering with recruiting agencies, as well as the establishment of international offices, which will help institutions to attract students to Zimbabwe. We expect these initiatives to contribute in making Zimbabwe the destination of choice for international students, as well for, as for international partnerships. We are ready to make our universities partner with international universities, uh, including the University of Nottingham, we partner with one of our universities and offering joint courses. These are issues that we are open to and we are saying, let's go for it. And the issue basically is to make sure that when we make sure that our, our, our syllabus, our curriculum is well internationally benchmarked, that becomes very easy because you can't come and cooperate with the Mickey Mouse University. It's not in the interest of any other university because it puts a blight on the brand of that other university. So the issue basically is that we must get organized. All what we are trying to say is that we are organizing the higher tertiary education system in Zimbabwe. We are already very lucky because we have the highest literacy in Africa, but we also say to Zimbabweans, hey, we have the highest literacy in Africa, but literacy is not necessarily education. It means you are ready for education. You are not yet educated. You are ready to be educated because you can code and decode. So lest we get too carried away by literacy, the issue is you are literate, but do you understand? So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, internationalization is not just about student mobility and collaborative engagement. It is about a complete change in mindset. Higher and tertiary education institutions need to embrace broader strategies, including the concept of internationalization at home, to ensure that the majority of students who are not in a position to study abroad can enjoy the benefits associated with international exposure. That's how we then interact with international students. May, may, they, may they be coming from UK to for study attachments or wherever. This is what we are saying. We are opening up the Zimbabwe's higher tertiary education institution to international collaboration and scrutiny. With international exposure, students gain confidence and develop networking skills. Government is operating MOUs with different countries, regionally and internationally, to put this strategy into effect. Remember, there is not one approach to internationalization. It can vary widely, depending on the context of the institution. While the institution can identify the opportunities in the international arena, the abundance of opportunities also makes it difficult for institutions to make the appropriate choice on how far and where they should go. In this context, the policy framework on internationalization of higher tertiary education is meant to act as, to prof to, as a guide to higher tertiary education institutions. So I really welcome the, the framework that you have produced. I know I gave a comment to say, please don't say policy framework. From your framework, I will produce a policy framework. From your framework, I will enjoy the inputs to make sure that they are included in the policy. Uh, I was laughing and said, hey, do you think you can make a policy for me? No, you don't. You give me inputs, then based on those inputs, I make a policy. But that policy is what you have done. Just a matter of semantics, but no, it's a matter of logic as well. <laughs> so this framework, which you now call the framework, is fully supported and is going to be an input into the formulation of our internationalization policy, which we will do. So it shall help institutions to strategize and position themselves in a coordinated way that will enhance the quality of education and the benefits thereof. I'm convinced that the high internationalization, high and tertiary education policy framework will give Zimbabwe a competitive advantage and position the higher and tertiary education sector to achieve Vision 2030, considering the progress that Zimbabwe has made in education relative to other African countries. As I conclude, a special appreciation goes to our local and international facilitators, our partner, the University of Nottingham, and main source of funding for this workshop. The University of Nottingham, our registrars, we have worked diligently in developing the ideas of all stakeholders into policy language. I am really very happy um, the first uh, university where I went to present my um, seminar as a PhD student at the University of Aachen was um, at the University of Nottingham with Professor Meta in the Department of Geography uh, in 2003 in March under the Royal Society on Remote Sensing. So 
I, from that day, I really like uh, the, the association with uh, the University of Nottingham. I know it does very well, especially in my area of specialization. They do very well. And uh, we are hoping for uh, stronger collaborations. And just to remind Zimbabweans that collaboration is collaboration. Yeah? No colonial mentality of saying, you should tell me uh, what I should know. Forget it. They are also waiting to hear from you. It's collaboration. No blanket of 1970. UK is looking forward to a developing Zimbabwe, which is also of benefit in terms of ideas to the systems. So we want to contribute and contribute with love, with peace, with prosperity, with happiness, and make sure that we make the world a better place for everyone to live in. Let's be good people. Let's be intelligent people. Let's be progressive people. Let's not be buckets that wait to be filled well by somebody else. There's no somebody to fill in that bucket. It's our work. I wish you a fruitful day of sharing and learning. My best wishes to you all. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Siabo, that's it. How will you go there? I said exactly what you were asking. You were asking me for impossible things. And now I'm telling you some impossible things. I want to go to Mars. The issue there which was being addressed is the issue of capability. How are you going to do it? So normally when we have an intent, which we say industrialize and modernize, we are not Western, saying westernize Zimbabwe. No. Zimbabwe must be a country that is also able to contribute to the world diversity. So it means modernize. It's not easternize. It's not westernize. It's not southernize. It is modernize so that you are able to be in a tapestry of the nations. Just imagine you want to be like me. If I we want to be like me and you are like me, why should I interact with you? Because I cannot interact with me. That's the basis of the beauty of diversity. The beauty of diversity tells you we are diverse, but we are not enemies. We are diverse, and diversity is beautiful. It means we can share our ideas. We know that uh, wind uh, comes from a high pressure zone going into a low pressure zone. If the earth equalizes in terms of pressure, it's a dead planet. That's a law of nature. So what that means is that our cooperation, for example, this beautiful cooperation between the University of Nottingham and Zimchen is a tapestry of beauty because there's a gradient. If there's no gradient, there's no need to interact because we are the same. So we need to bring national capability. We need to be able to do we need to be able to do things. But to be able to do things, you have to have the correct configuration of our education. We have to have the correct design. Because if the design is wrong, your intentions, your capability cannot be attained. Therefore, your intention cannot be attained. So we are talking about three things here. An appropriate education design that leads to a national capability. A national capability that is able to meet our national intentions, our international intentions as a peaceful democratic country in the family of nations. So, what we are basically saying is that all of this, if there's a good design of education, which leads to a good capability, which leads to the meeting of intentions, it means this kind of education is ready for internationalization. It's ready to share. It's ready to interact. It's ready to interlock. It's ready to complement, not necessarily commit. We are implementing our national vision through executing uh, a higher tertiary education system that is, as I say, fit for purpose of developing Zimbabwe, developing Africa, developing the world. We have conceived our education 5.0 model because all along, the missions of universities in Zimbabwe have been teach, research, 
workshops. Teach, research, workshops. Teach, research, workshops. So going round and round, teach, research, workshops. If you say, okay, guys, why is our agricultural productivity law? They'll say, oh, no, 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 that's not my, those are not my terms of reference. So one wonders what an education is there for. What kind of education makes a nation hungry? What kind of an education makes people go and look for medical care elsewhere? elsewhere? Hmm. What kind of an education is that? What kind of an education would cause uh, poverty? Why are we saying we are so educated and we are so hungry? What kind of an education is it where a country has got 94% literacy and 38% skills level? Medicine, 5% skills level. Science, 3% skills level. Law, 8% skills level. Humanities, 13% surplus. Commerce, 21% surplus in skills. So, and the issue basically is that we have an education whereby if a person finishes, they say, I want a job. So I wonder what you were doing inside there that makes you come out of that place so useless that you are now asking for things instead of being a provider. In all normal countries, universities industrialize their countries. But our model of Education 3.0 was necessarily a design for working in a designed industry designed by somebody else, not ourselves. So if we know that this was the weakness, then we would then say any university must have five intentions, which is teach, research, community service, innovation and industrialization. Innovation and industrialization cannot be an activity which is outside of the universities. So this is what we call Education 5.0. Education 3.0 is necessarily an education for training a worker, but a worker for whose industry? Where is the industry? Because there has been an argument in this country where they say there are no jobs. I differ. I differ with that. There are a lot of jobs in this country. But that, those jobs are not meeting capability. There are a lot of jobs. You cannot say there are no jobs when you are importing 70% um, uh, of your food requirements. You cannot say there are no jobs when you are exporting patients. You, are say, you cannot say that you, there are no jobs when you are importing 1 billion of medicines. And you say you have got a medical school. There must be something wrong with this configuration. We can't say we don't have jobs in Zimbabwe. We when problems meet capability, you create jobs. That's how jobs are created. So let's not imagine, because if you say you want to work for me and you can't work for yourself, then how do you work for me when you can't work for yourself? Maybe I don't want you to work for me. Because what kind of education produces uselessness? Yeah, because a person says, I'm helpless, even goes to the street with a gown and says, I'm jobless. The, it means there's something wrong with that configuration. It's a system that is piling people in a corner that are, in essence, useless. So we are saying, by doing Education 5.0, we are assured of a system that produces people, that produce an industry, that continue innovating. And that's how normal countries have developed. All countries have developed using the like that. And sometimes I wonder, what made us not do things? No, we tried to confuse the colonial model with the post-independence model. Because normal universities in developed countries were always doing that. And we got caught up in this thing of saying, we are waiting for a job to work for Lancashire Steel. But Lancashire Steel went back to the UK. It's not yours. So it's a simple model, it's a simple thing of trying to wait for Godot. You are waiting for a person that doesn't come at all. So that's why we have now transformed our education to Education 5.0 to say, hey, 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 look, wake up, wake up. And that industrialist who has been trained at the University of Edinburgh must now be trained at the University of Zimbabwe. Don't forget. 
that the University of Zimbabwe is no longer a college of the University of London. Because the Queen in 1980 said you could be independent. So agree to be independent and be able to contribute to the world. Simple and straightforward. We kept on sleeping under the colonial blanket. It's over. Move. Now you must be cooperating with the UK as equals to create and co-create. But some people are still waiting for things to come. There are no things. You have to wait. So it's so simple. That's why we have moved to Education 5.0 to say, hey, hey, the model whereby you have been given the syllabus by the University of London is over. They, are, they have moved. So you still use the Charter of 1952, which was the University of London syllabus, and you think, oh, that's the standard. No, the University of London has moved. It has moved. Why well, you thought that you are doing standards of the University of London? They are, it's, it's gone miles ahead of you. So all these issues are basically don't fossilize, move. Don't fossilize, move. So we had a problem, if I can use this word, of course it's severe, but I continue using it. No fossilization, move. So these are the issues that we want. If we want our education to have international flavor, we must be seen to be moving, and we must move. So, and we say it, for our education to contribute to this whole world, it must also be heritage-based. Trade by nature is based on things that you have that the other one doesn't have. So it's gradients, simply. You cannot be in Harare and find a small coal mine with 2,000 tons, and then you mine those 2,000 tons of coal, you try to sell to Wange, which has got 8,000 years supply of coal. What kind of stupidity is that? So, as I said, <laughs> there should not be any confusion in the way we do it. So what we are saying is that all our education, all our physics, all our chemistry, all our biochemistry, everything should be based on heritage. Look at things that you have, study them, use the most modern technique, cooperate with your partners throughout the world without any preference. Everybody, to work with everybody on earth who is called a human being, equally and with love. When you do that, you cooperate, working on the resources of Zimbabwe, you produce your medicines, and so forth and so forth. Your medicine could, not, could probably not come from the Amazon, because this is a different environment. So all these kinds of things are what we are saying on heritage-based education 5.0. So we are saying, <laughs> uh, we, we, we actually did um, an educational design analysis that is the one that said, oh, oh, this one, Education 3.0, now we have to move to Education 5.0. Colleagues at the Ministry of Higher Education, um, colleagues in Zinche, uh, colleagues from educational institutions from across, and across Zimbabwe, uh, welcome, uh, all protocols observed. Uh, first of all, I'm not the uh, ambassador, unfortunately, she has a much nicer house than me. Uh, I am the head of trade at the British Embassy, uh, Tom Hill. I've been here for one year and I've actually been very privileged to visit a number of educational institutions from across the country, um, which has been a privilege. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, the UK's academic credentials. Um, the UK's academic reputation is world-renowned, built on a, on a heritage that is centuries old. In 2018, three of the world's top ten universities um, were from the UK. Many teachers in the UK are leaders in their field, uh, and the Minister talked about industry and a link between education and industry, and that is something that we have developed in the UK. And the UK is also famous for its world leading research. Uh, it's ranked second in the world for science and research. Uh, on Nottingham University, I can tell you that my, my mother actually went there, so I can vouch that it is very good. <laughs> Um, that, leads, that, leads, that leads us to um, this collaboration, um, and I'm delighted to see this partnership between the UK and Zimbabwe's higher education institutions, uh, and as the Minister said, this collaboration in the form of equals. Uh, Zimbabwe institutions are doing important and critical work. I've been to Africa University, I've seen the work they're doing in relation to malaria, 
and Bindura and Chennai, the work they're doing on agronomy and agrology. And these are issues that are specific to the region, specific to Zimbabwe. So obviously, you know, any program, any solution needs to be, a, um, as the minister said again, tailored to this country. I'm also um, hoping to, uh, hoping that we can announce a new partnership between uh, a Zimbabwean institution and a group of UK universities in the coming months. Mm -hmm. And uh, in September last year, I was fortunate enough to take a group of uh, Zimbabwean producers and farmers to Harper Adams University, uh, the Agroecology University in the UK. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we are working to um, support Harper Adams students uh, find placements, uh, placements in industry in Zimbabwe, uh, which will be a benefit to them and will be a benefit to the agricultural sector here. Uh, also, um, the reason I have to uh, leave actually, um, not, not so urgently, but in, in a short time, is because we're also supporting um, the University of Zimbabwe, uh, and it's actually not the university that are doing this, uh, in their research capability, um, which obviously is, a, is an important pillar of this in internationalization strategy. Uh, so there's a lot of um, collaboration going on between the UK and Zimbabwe, and I'm delighted to see it uh, continuing here. Internationalisation is critical uh, to the growth of higher education in this country uh, and not just the growth of higher education but the growth of the economy, the growth of civil discourse, of political discourse, of research, innovation. It all stems from higher education as the Minister said and internationalisation is a key part of that. So to finish I would just like to congratulate Nottingham University, Zimche, the Ministry and all those involved for developing uh, very robust strategy and I for one um, am very passionate to see it implemented and as a British Embassy I would like to offer our support as far as we can in making sure it can be. Thank you very much. And, uh, colleagues, we are just going to briefly uh, go back in history and uh, talk about the assignment uh, that was given to us and registrars of universities when we last met here uh, in 2018 on the 3rd of July. I, I hope there's a picture there showing all of us who gathered there on this day. The permanent secretary has already alluded to the fact that uh, we were there uh, together on this business of internationalization of higher and tertiary education. I remember vividly the Honorable Minister giving an earth-shaking presentation of his vision of higher and tertiary education in Zimbabwe. Uh, I caught him. He said that we are thinking big. We are creating and constructing a higher education system of our dreams. A multi-million dollar higher education sector that produces goods and services to achieve Vision 2020. And he said, no one can do it for us but ourselves, not even uh, the imaginary character that he called a uh, bodot. <laughs> what were the uh, expected objectives of this particular gathering that we had on the 3rd of July? It was to develop high level principles and guidelines and establish broad parameters that provide a national framework for internationalization of higher and tertiary education within which institutions can develop and align their own institutional internationalization strategies. So this was the business of the day and what were the resolutions that came out of that workshop? A task force of registrars was selected to compile and further develop and work on the suggestions from the working groups into a draft 
framework for internationalization. And they were to do this with the assistance of Zimche, with the assistance of experts from the University of Nottingham, and also we had uh, on that group Mrs. Kavia, uh, who is the legal uh, director for legal affairs at our ministry, to work on these suggestions that were coming up and come up with a draft uh, document that was then to be presented to the Honorable Minister by November 2019. Uh, Honorable Minister, we are in November 2019 today. <laughs> <laughs> so the registrars have done their work. They took over a year, several meetings, all of them gathering at the cost of the higher and tertiary education institutions. We really need to thank uh, the support of the institution. <laughs> so after doing that hard work, they are then today going to present to us what they came up with not as a final document, but as something that has to be thoroughly discussed before we can ever hope to give a document uh, to the minister uh, through Zimche, as we were asked to do. At that particular workshop again, we listened to Professor Zimba, who was representing vice chancellors. He told us again that vice chancellors had met in December 2017, to come up with a theory of change, with a theory of change for internationalization of higher education in Zimbabwe. And he presented their business case. He talked about the motivation, which was to raise the profile of higher education institutions, intellectual diversity, and the quality of higher and tertiary education. And the solution there was to come up with locally relevant and globally competitive programs and solutions so that we can be able to be competitive as a country and also to achieve Vision 2030 that was uh, elaborated by our minister having our country uh, uh, achieving the upper middle income uh, status. So this is the work that was done. Uh, Professor Tondlana here, I'm going to hand over to her to talk about the research part of the work because you know everything that has to be done. We need evidence-based approaches. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Garwin. So um, research is critical for any meaningful uh, decisions that can be made for a country, for an institution, and we are very happy to say that uh, one of the key tasks that we were given was to conduct research. So this framework has not come from people sitting in an office and just making decisions on behalf of the country of Zimbabwe, but it has come from listening, getting all the voices on board, therefore we followed the scientific process of sampling and then getting a view of a few to guide us in terms of the issues that we needed to pursue, to dig more. And we were then able, you know, the various workshops that, were, that, were, that followed our scoping study were meant to incorporate the voices of all institutions. So as we are seated here today, not a single institution has not added a voice. All institutions have been able to express their thoughts about an internationalization uh, program for Zimbabwe. And uh, so, you know, what you are seeing there is a, a, an overview of the various stages. The idea of uh, going into a, 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 you know, an in-depth study of internationalization came from an Africa-wide uh, 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 research project where Zimbabwe was involved, and as we were conducting research on the organizational and research cultures of African universities, Zimbabwean institutions said, were saying that international
professionalization was one of the key solutions to the challenges that academics were facing in conducting research in Zimbabwe. And therefore, instead of us just sitting down and saying, let's now come up, uh, go to the ministry and say, this is what institutions are saying, we were then told that we needed to conduct research. So we then, uh, as part of uh, you know, a bigger study going beyond the uh, OCA project, as Zimbabwe embarked on this study. And so we started with a scoping in July 2017, we moved on, we gave our uh, findings, we presented our findings to Zimche, we had a whole day of Zimche deliberating on the findings and then deciding how to move on. We then uh, called all the vice chancellors uh, and uh, some representatives of tertiary institutions uh, to table to deliberate further and to uh, make decisions. And then in July 2018, the Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education led us in a workshop where all stakeholders, not only higher education institutions, but all other ministries that would be involved in, a, in internationalization, for example, uh, the Ministry of, fi the ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Home Affairs, every ministry that would have something to do with the internationalization were at that all stakeholder workshop. And Dr. Garwe has just uh, given us the outcomes of that workshop. So what we are saying is that research has to underpin everything that is going to happen. Even when it comes to the implementation of uh, the policies that the minister is going to give us if I eventually as institutions of higher education, we are going to need institutions to go into rigorous processes of researching uh, the uh, practices to make sure that they are achieving the intended goals. I hand over to you, Dr. Uh, yes, Juliet, uh, research is important, uh, but we did find out that it was not only research that was important. The commitment of all the players was really, really important. The support from visionary leadership was critical. Capacity building also and advice from experts. Uh, the reason why the University of Nottingham was chosen was that at Zimche, when we did benchmarking to look at uh, an institution that we can work with in the area of internationalization, we found that the University of Nottingham was a giant in this area. Here, Professor Tongana will tell you that she teaches in how many continents? Almost all continents. I've just come back from India. <laughs> They are highly internationalized, and we thought they would be a good partner for us to give us uh, the capacity building that we needed. Then funding is also important. Our ministry was key in providing funding. Zimche provided funding. I've already talked about the funding we got from institutions, and also to thank the funding that we got from the University of Nottingham. Uh, we really want to thank you for giving us uh, uh, your ears. Thank you. I'm curious um, uh, to know what exactly was Professor Bebe talking about. <laughs> when I was a very young undergraduate student, I want to mention the year. I was barely 20, I think I was 19 years old. Professor Bebe in a West African university called Fora Bay College in Sierra Leone uh, taught me history. But what I fondly remember is when he taught the history of Lobengula and the British, when he taught about the Rad concession, he taught and spoke as if he was actually there. <laughs> That's why some of us have never forgotten that history, because you were the best teacher. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm. Good morning, colleagues, and a special welcome to our guest from within and outside Zimbabwe. 
a special welcome to all of you, and especially our Honorable Minister, Professor Dr. Amon Mubia. We welcome you, sir, for a number of reasons, but one special one, because you continue to make us extremely uncomfortable when you speak about reconfiguring and redesigning and reconstructing our higher and tertiary education system. So we thank you for making us so uncomfortable so that we can think about our higher education system in a very different way. So we welcome you, sir, and we'll continue to welcome your leadership and your very creative thoughts that for some of us, we, we lose sleep because the pace that you are setting is unparalleled. No wonder why even people as far as Ghana want to hear what you say about higher education. So you are very welcome, sir, uh, to, this, to this workshop. We thank you for coming. I also want to welcome in absentia our Deputy Minister, Honorable Raimo Machingura, and the Permanent Secretary of our Ministry, Professor Taguira. Sir, thank you very much for continuing to work with us and for providing that technical leadership. I want to welcome the Director of Ceremonies and Chairman of the Zimche Council, Professor Enem Bebe. You're most welcome, sir, and we thank you very much for coming all the way from Gwelu to be with us uh, this morning. I also want to welcome my colleagues, the esteemed uh, Vice-Chancellors and Pro-Vice-Chancellors that are present with us today. I welcome the Executive Director of the Research Council of Zimbabwe, um, Mrs. S. Mutizia. If, Muzita, sorry. If your ears were ringing in the morning, don't go afar to search why your ears were ringing. It was me talking to one of your colleagues about an issue that we want to make an appointment to come and talk to you. I also want to welcome my colleague, Dr. Lazarus Nembawari, uh, directors from the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, especially the colleague representing uh, Mrs. Mugutti, um, <coughs> and all senior government officials here present. I also welcome representatives of principals, representatives and principals of polytechnics and teachers' colleges, the chairman of registrar's IHTE framework dra drafting task force, Dr. Thomas Bebe, you're welcome, sir, from Chinoy, uh, University of Technology, and all the other registrars. I've seen quite a few of them. Um, I really want to welcome a colleague um, and a professional friend Professor Sabel Ndrovu, whom I knew for a very long time when I was dean at um, UNISA, where he is currently a senior <coughs> professor. You are most welcome, and I join Professor Bebe to thank you for coming back home to share your ideas with the motherland and all of us you know, back home. We thank you very much, and we are extremely uh, grateful. I would like to thank my two colleagues, uh, Professor Tondlana, and Dr. Evelyn Garwe, our key colleagues who have made this day and workshop possible. I also want to thank those of us who support this initiative and are not here uh, with us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with the strategic thrust of our parent ministry, and in particular the Herculean efforts of our Honorable Minister, Professor Dr. Amon Murwira, to reconfigure higher education in Zimbabwe. I'm glad to let you know that the Zimche and his partners at Nottingham University and all the higher and tertiary education institutions in Zimbabwe are very happy to present the draft framework for the internationalization of higher education in Zimbabwe. And Minister, thank you very much for that little lesson that I had with you in your office uh, one evening. You probably didn't realize that I was sweating. And, and, and when I went back to the driver, I, 
Uh, he said, Sir, when we drove from the office, you did not even say a word. Now I can see you are smiling and you want to go and with me to Nando's to go and eat. What happened in there? I just said, Munumuna, Zaka Omazin is when you're at a church. But thank you. The lesson was taken. This framework, ladies and gentlemen, is in line with the new vision of our parent ministry as articulated in the new philosophy of heritage-based education and its blueprint of Education 5.0, which has made us rethink the way we think about the provision of higher education in the country. For us, as articulated by the minister, the experience by graduates in our higher education institutions must result in the production of new knowledge. It must result in the production of goods and services so that we can achieve the status of an upper middle income economy by 2030. On behalf of the Zimshin and our partner Nottingham University, under the guidance of Professor Juliet Londana, Dr. Evelyn Garu, Professor Paul Knight, Dr. Hadisa Abdul Rahman, and others, I welcome you all to deliberate on this very important topic of the draft framework for the internationalization of higher and tertiary education in Zimbabwe. Of course, we should not forget that we must start from our own philosophical and epistemological base so as to focus on what our keynote speaker, Professor Savelin Lovo, refers to as the decolonial epistemic. That is essential in undergirding our discourse, discourse practices of internationalizing higher education. That discourse, ladies and gentlemen, must acknowledge our history it must acknowledge our culture, and it must acknowledge our material conditions of our current existence, so that the university can occupy its central and pivotal place in the quintuple helix framework to assist the country on its path to industrialization. My colleague, Professor Zgobo, leads a university that is not far from Bikita Minerals, where lithium is mined. I hope we can find a day when lithium batteries are actually produced in Zimbabwe, as the Honorable Minister was referring to in his speech. He gave an example of the American University, and I know if he had time, he would have talked about the American Land Grant Institution, all the big state universities in the United States, which started in the 1700s and 1800s. The main focus was for them to be the motive force for the development and in particular the industrialization of the United States. And ladies and gentlemen, the minister is spot on. So we must change the genetic code of the university in this country inside out so that the university occupies its central position as the minister was articulating. If we don't do that, we have a serious challenge. Our focus has to be inter alia on the following. How can we increase the presence of international students in our higher education system? Number two, how can we increase our research outputs by working jointly with colleagues in the region, the continent, and in both the global north and the global south, but still retain our identity and heritage as a people and as a nation and as intellectuals? and as organic intellectuals that are committed to the social, economic, and industrialization of this country. And the emphasis is on the development of organic intellectuals. Number three, discussing how we as a sector can join the global rankings. This obviously, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely controversial. If we are to attract international students, as the minister has told us, and staff, we must be able to compete regionally and globally. Global ranking, therefore, is a must. I'm going to work tirelessly with all of you so that the issue of global rankings becomes part and parcel of our agenda. If we want to attract international students, they'll obviously go on your website to see where you stand globally with whichever global ranking, whether the Times Higher Education Supplement, the Shanghai Rankings, or even the African ones. So it is essential that we must go that route. Number four, 
We need to enhance an internationalized curriculum. The minister talked about it. That internationalized curriculum must be grounded in our history. It must be grounded in our culture and discourse practices so that the higher education system has to be designed, has to be redesigned and reconfigured so that it can ensure that our graduates that can drive the social, economic, and industrialization of this country. Two of my colleagues, I haven't asked for their permission, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Zimbabwe, Professor Mafumu, said to us in a meeting, I will translate for those of us that don't speak Shona. We're talking about one particular program, and I won't mention which one. He said, to Varura. He said, this program, we want to tear it apart. When we've torn it apart, then we can sew it together. The sociologist who was in there, the vice chancellor of the Midland State University, used a different imagery. He said, we want to deconstruct these programs and then reconstruct them again so that they are based on our heritage, they are based on our culture, they are based on our philosophy, they are based on our values. So what the minister is talking about, ladies and gentlemen, we have to do it. I don't think we've got any options. Because if we don't do it, then we put the country at risk. Number five, we must engender an innovative university that changes its genetic code inside out so that it can work with international partners in basic and applied research that results in patterns related to transforming our Zimbabwean and African societies. I was talking to my mother last weekend, and she said to me, my son, because of the sun that came, worms have gone into the maize crop. Even though the rains have come, my maize crop has been decimated. Can't we go back to the crops that we used to grow? And then, Minister, I talked about you. I said, Mother, my boss preaches about this gospel that we should stop growing maize and go to the so-called small grains. And ladies and gentlemen, when the minister says, let us reconfigure our higher education, this is what he's talking about. <clears throat> we must fundamentally shift the form, the content, the orientation of our curriculum to be able to change the, gen the genetic code of our higher education institutions inside out. If we don't do that, the figure that we hear people quoting of eight or seven million people that need food assistance will continue because we are growing a crop that is not original to our nation. So the minister is telling us to rethink the way we think about curriculum before. As our honorable minister, Professor Dr. Amon Muriro, continues to show us any meaningful reform of our higher and tertiary education system must start from our heritage. As such, ladies and gentlemen, and I quote, ideology critique must be central to critical reflection and by implication to the transformation of higher education, end of quote. Our focus, ladies and gentlemen, as higher education educators should be to use a heritage-based education and critical reflection to lay bare the historically and socially sedimented values at work in the construction and reconstruction of knowledge, our social relations, and material practices so that we can locate a critique of the current discourse practices of higher education within a radical notion of interest and social transformation as opined by the minister. This is what he's talking about. That there must be a radical shift in the way we think about higher education. There must be a radical shift in the way we put together our curriculum 
And we are saying to all of us, let us borrow the notion of a program qualification mix. I keep saying to my colleagues, the vice chancellors, and the deans and senate members, and I want to say it in front um, of the minister, it's going to be difficult for us as Zimshel to approve any new program for an MBA if in that program you are not asking your students either to have an option of conversational Chinese, of conversational Portuguese, of conversational French. The reason, ladies and gentlemen, is very clear. You can no longer produce an MBA graduate who is not able to talk trade, to sell our goods and products in Mozambique, in Angola, and even in the French-speaking countries. We're not trying to be dictatorial, but we're trying to follow what the minister and His Excellency, the President, is talking about. This, in my view, will help us to frame the objectives of this workshop only if it involves a fundamental reordering of how we think about internationalizing higher and tertiary education in Zimbabwe. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to remind you that we have a critical role to play in ensuring that education is at the center of transforming this nation. This calls for a reconfiguration of teaching and learning in our universities. Here, I just want to borrow from my favorite author, Etienne Wenger, who argues that learning constitutes trajectories of participation. It builds personal histories in relation to the histories of our communities, thus connecting our past and heritage and our future in a process of individual and collective becoming as the minister talks about. Number two, furthermore, learning must be a matter of imagination within the higher education institution. It depends on a process of orientation, a process of reflection, a process of exploration to place our identities as academics and as leaders in a broader context that ensures that higher education helps to produce goods and services, and in the final analysis, develops this economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the best way to predict the future is to create it, according to Peter Drucker. Mm -hmm. Finally, we must ensure that learning involves an interplay between the local and the global in our universities. It takes place in practice, but defines and redefines a global context for its own locality and hence the need for the draft framework for the internationalization of higher and tertiary education in Zimbabwe. Ladies and gentlemen, Albert Einstein has taught us that problems, I like this quote, problems cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created them. Hence the need for transforming this higher education system so that it is grounded in our past, in our present, and in our future. I thank you. Pepe, uh, one of the first emeritus professors in Zimbabwe, and I also being a Pepe, first one to address such a high-powered uh, meeting, uh, first registrar to do that. <laughs> the other registrars will come after me. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, our, 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 this, you, you have heard from Dr. Garwe that it, this, this document was all 
all-encompassing. Everybody saw it at, at a certain stage. So I would try to cruise through. What I was asked to do was just to have a fly past overview and let you know what is in the Zirimukapu, what is inside uh, the document. Um, acknowledgements. We started with acknowledgements where we acknowledge your, 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 the ministry. Sir. It's, it's, a, it's well acknowledged, Zimche. We acknowledged you. International partners, thank you very much. Uh, Nottingham as Office of, for Global Engagement and also the funding and cost sharing from the Ministry and Nottingham's uh, uh, through the, uh, the Economic and Social Research Council uh, Impact Factor Account. Thank you for that. We acknowledge those things and the Vice Chancellors who came up with the vision to begin with and then they gave it to the registrars and the wide range of stakeholders. Uh, you have heard about the, 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 third, the, the, the July 2018 meeting. Uh, registrars of all state and private universities. Uh, also, thank you very much. Uh, we acknowledge you in the, in the document. I'm simply running through the document and what it contains. It is, uh, we, we acknowledge the user, the NAST, Buse, this is the order in which the universities were formed. And uh, GZU, then KMMSU, uh, CART, GZU, HIT, and LS, uh, Lupane, Marondera, Manikaland, and the Zimbabwe National Defense University. We were working with these as a team and a network and a family of universities, but we also had our colleagues from the private universities. We had uh, AU, they were there, Solusi, they were there, Catholic. We also had UWA, we had uh, Zegu. We had uh, a reformed church, and we also had uh, um, Arupe Jesuit University. This is the family that, that uh, brought this, this, uh, this document we are talking about, which the minister warned us that is not a policy framework, it's simply a framework. We, we also we have an executive summary which simply says uh, internationalization speaks to the original reason of the universities. We were checking the, the origin, why universities were formed. You know, primary school is like, the knowledge is like at village level, and then secondary school, we widen the scope uh, tertiary until we get universities means the whole, the whole. So when we talk internationalization, we are simply going back to the original ethos of why universities were formed. Internationalization is at the, at, at the root of higher education. We have no choice. It is unavoidable. Either we do it or we lose, either we swim or we sink. Knowledge should not have borders. This is the, the philosophy behind. And a good product should be good across borders. If our university, our education is good in Zimbabwe, therefore it should be good across borders and let us be able to, to have it uh, consumed by others. A good product should be tested and uh, on a wider market and it should stand out. The, the intended outcomes were, were, were crafted by the vice chancellors uh, in 2018. They said one of them to increase the presence of international students and also have active MOUs, uh, have increased impact factor publications, increased uh, harmonization, uh, harmonized programs and curricula, favorite, uh, favorable international rankings, I think one presenter talked about them. And the increased innovation and IP outputs. Uh, institutional capability, these were the outcomes that the vice chancellors gave to the registrars. Um, the overview of the chapters. We had chapter one, which we called background policy, policy and legislation. Chapter two was the rationale and purpose of our internationalization and the responsibilities for key players in the success of internationalization have been put in chapter three. Chapter four is about the students and staff mobility. Chapter five, international research collaboration. Chapter six, cross-border teaching and international collaboration, and then chapter seven, governance. Our last chapter was chapter eight, which spoke to internationalization of curriculum. The definition of key terms. It is, it's important for us to understand what we are calling internationalization. We are saying it's a well-planned, coordinated, intentionally steered process of integrating, infusing internal 
intercultural and international global dimensions into the agenda of higher education uh, institutions in order to extend the influence beyond borders and push the frontiers of knowledge by advancing goals, functions, and delivery of higher education. What a mouthful. Clap hands for registrars. That was, it, it's all encompassing. Right. A MOU, this is a non-legally binding document. An MOA is a legally binding document. A policy framework, which uh, the minister was talking, it, a framework is a document which sets out procedures, goals, and guidelines and regulations to be followed. So we, in chapter one, we simply were talking about background policy. We looked at the Research Council, the National Qualifications Framework, the, the ZIMCAT, SADAC protocol. It informed us what we need to do, the higher education policy and doctrine 5.0, the Ministry of, of, of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development, the strategy 2019 to 2023, and the Immigration Act. These we read through and in order to understand the background uh, before we started crafting the document. Chapter 2, the rationale, purpose for the internationalization of higher education. We, we looked at the purpose. We said it provides new opportunities for higher education institutions. It prepares students for a globalized economy. It, it gives extra income from international students and it cultivates interculturalism and international competence and awareness and tolerance and consciousness. The minister is not happy with the word employment. However, employers the world over are prepared to pay high premiums for recruiting international, uh, internationalized graduates who have gone through an international education. It promotes the understanding and it is essential peace, uh, for peace and stability as, as well as security. It improves standards and we said uh, it also provides an opportunity for higher education institutions to infect each other uh, for development. The rationale continued, produces international scholars. You don't want a university graduate who is, you know, localized. You want an international scholar. Enhances international profile for somebody who was talking about ranking. Internationalization is one thing that will assist us to be ranked favorably. It opens opportunities for collaboration and it promotes brain drain and brain circulation. It also promotes brain gain and it also develops local human capital. It also has spillover effects to destination branding. Uh, once you have international students, you know they will talk well about your country when they graduate and go. Internationalization is common denominator to unite nations and it increases the visibility uh, and it also promotes uniformity and teamwork. It also creates synergies. It also showcases quality, the quality we talk about, and it helps to fly with the eagles. You have to fly with the eagles. You can't remain localized. And it also gives an opportunity to, to be abreast with international trends. The goals of, the, of, the, of this framework, we, to increase the presence of international students, to encourage collaborative research, to provide a platform for recruitment of staff, uh, to encourage brain gain and, and brain circulation, also to provide a platform for sharing research equipment, facilities and, the, and the resource constraints. It also helps us to provide guidelines to higher education institutions to, which intend to offer programs across the borders. And it also gives and ensures uniformity in the higher education, in the way higher education institutions package and present their courses and programs outside Zimbabwe. Uh, we come to the key players in the higher in the, edu in the higher education uh, sector. We have the, the Ministry of Higher and Teacher Education and Innovation, Science and Technology Development, whose primary role is to articulate at that strategic level the national aspirations, in this case, which is the 
uh, vision 2030 and how universities are going to be a major key holder, a major key player in, in the achievement of the vision 2030. We have um, the Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, which will be responsible for the immigration aspects of uh, foreign students as well as uh, lecturers, uh, maybe on the exchange program. And then we have the Ministry also of Foreign Affairs, which is going to play, to play a, a key role in the internationalization strategy. In we are also saying that uh, Zinche, they should uh, actually be the authority where all higher uh, education institutions should apply for authority to take their programs uh, across the border. And those programs should be fully funded from where they are going to be offered. In the spirit of our Constitution, uh, Amendment 20, Section 75, it gives any person, institution, or organization uh, the right to offer education within the country for as long as it is in line with, with our laws. So, based on that, we are saying that uh, the Ministry and Zinche should actually promote international um, um, higher education institutions to come into the country and offer their program and they maintain playing the gatekeeping role. Then, uh, for cross-border uh, teaching um, in Zimbabwe by foreign institutions, we are saying as they are coming through, what are some of the prerequisites that we want to have on board? We are saying first, they should apply through Zimche, which is our authority in that area, on the programs that they want to offer. And we are also saying for the programs to be offered, they have to be unique. So we do not want replication of programs that we already have and which we may also have excess demand. Reference can be made to the national skills uh, uh, framework. What um, should Zinche do? They should ensure that the institutions are accredited in their own country, that's number one. They should also ensure that that institution is also offering the same qualification in their home country. And they should also check on the capacity to say what capacity do they have and do they have the experience to deliver across the border. Then Zincha also has to ensure that there is clearance of that institution with their home country. The same way that we want our institutions to be cleared should also apply. And this also helps us in terms of quality management issues. Zimche, we are also saying it can seek recommendations. So by recommendations, they will also want to look at credibility issues and value addition issues. Then uh, Zimche, we are also saying at some point, looking at the institutions that are coming in, they may see opportunities. And those opportunities, they can tap on them by promoting things like skills transfer, uh, collaborative research and student exchange. So this is all part of uh, the internationalization process. Zimche are also saying it should give clearance of these programs and these programs should be allowed to run right up to the end. We, we will expect that students who engage would have invested so they should run through their entire program and graduate. Then Zimche should also um, spearhead enabling statutes and they should also be able to charge a fee for their administrative course. I think it's also part of sustaining our authority. What policies do we need to have in place for the institutions? One, a training policy, an internal one, which should be in place by early June 2020. Higher education institutes should align and have an internal policy that aligns to the national uh, qualifications policy by early June 2020. An intellectual policy, um, um, for each institution should also be in place because if we are looking at research innovation, we cannot do that without having an intellectual uh, property policy in place. The research policy, if you are promoting research, we need to have a policy that guides the type of research that we want for us to align with the goals of uh, 
the ministry. Chapter 7, it basically looks at governance. So we are saying everything that we're going to be doing, it has to be formalized. So the uh, formalization could be institution to institution. Sometimes it may also involve government, but we are saying everything has to be documented for legal compliance. Right. On internationalization of curricula, we are saying as we are internationalizing our curricula, we need to be able to deal with our reputable institutions and we are aligning to the goals of Education 5.0. And this should also incorporate critical issues like uh, intercultural and global dimension. The issue of managing diversity is actually a core skill for 2020. The issue of benchmarking is one other issue that uh, we also need to look at as we are internationalizing our curricula. So for benchmarking, the use of external examiners is critical. External assessors, curriculum reviewers, they also help us to see some uh, blind spots in terms of our own curriculum. Contact visits, we need to promote contact visits so that we see what is happening in other places. Staff and student exchanges. This is critical. We need to build capacity in our staff and students. For staff, if we don't build capacity in our staff because we fear they will run away, imagine what will happen if we don't build capacity and they stay. <laughs> Sabbatical leave. Joint teaching and supervision. Draw award of degrees. So this we are saying that if we start working with renowned uh, international experts. They will help us in terms of our teaching evaluation, content um, depth, the resources that we need. Sometimes we may want to bring new programs, so we need to know the resources we need to achieve that. Achievement of minimum body of knowledge, assignments, timetabling, marking um, schemes, examination, moderation, uh, admission requirements, and even the qualifications that we'll need in certain areas that we may desire to uh, venture into. So what are some of the policies that we need for us to uh, sustain uh, internationalization? So first we need to have curriculum review policies in every institution by 30 June 2020. Staff and student exchange programs policy by 30 June uh, 2020. So we need to quickly move with speed on that. The industrial attachment or internship policy, we also need to have it by 30 June 2020. It should also allow cross-border and that's our attachment for our students. Then admission and credit transfer policy, same that deadline, 30 June 2020. Then that one is the big one, global credit accumulation and transfer system by 30 June 2020, which should allow people to move. Thank you. We have run you through, ladies and gentlemen, the eight chapters. Well, we, uh, uh, we took you from there and I am the one who took you through our acknowledgments, the whole network of universities, the executive summary, and I also took you through chapter one and chapter two, which touched the background and the rationale. My colleague Mary Sampindi, the, 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 the registrar of HEAT, took you through chapter three, four, and five. It was just a fly through the key players, students, staff mobility, records, and research collaboration. My, my friend, Mr. Njinga, took you from Africa University, they are quite experienced in this internationalization game. And uh, he took you through course for the teaching, governance and curricula. It's, uh, it's now done. And in conclusion, we shared with you the contents of the draft policy, the draft uh, framework, and, uh, and we justified that internationalization is not an option, we have to do it. We outline the roles of each key player and with timelines, and we also, uh, what remains is for me to thank you all most sincerely on behalf of registrars. You have been good participants. We salute you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for according registrars an opportunity to serve. We are humbled. Thank you very much, Regis. You've done a very good job. 
uh, you've taken us through the draft, uh, draft policy framework for internationalization. What I'm happy about is that all the players that are necessary for the operationalization of this draft policy are here. The universities themselves are represented at the top by the vice chancellors and the registrars. The Zimche is represented fully by ourselves. And the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, by none other than the boss himself, the Honorable Minister, is here. So we are all here. Uh, I'm not sure what should be done with the draft, it's called the draft policy. It has to become a policy. <laughs> Uh, where does it get its approval, Honorable Minister? I think you will guide us and the Permanent Secretary uh, on that one. The, the framework. So it shall remain the framework. It shall, it, shall, it shall remain a draft framework. No. It shall become the framework. The framework. Because government has already approved the internationalization. Thank you very much indeed. So we adopted uh, some point as a final document. That's so, it. What is here is very interesting. Just to say uh, that will show the very high level of organization. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what happened uh, in terms of the registrars and so forth. I think I think you are keeping your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. That's the guidance that we were seeking. Because when I was looking at it as a draft, and we need, we need to formally adopt it, really. We need to formally adopt it uh, with all of us here present uh, so that it becomes the policy, policy framework. <laughs> Thank you very much. facilitators have all presented. We now move outside uh, and our representative for the foreign uh, facilitators will be Dr. Adiza Abdurrahman. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Let me start by acknowledging the presence of the Honorable Minister, the presence of my esteemed colleagues, and everyone else. I'm really, really happy to be here. This is my first time in Harare, and I'm still pretty much excited. Now, I know I have a tough job, because the last slides, I don't know if you are watching, very amazing imagery, like all the ways they made it so technical. Mine is nothing like that. I'm just risen. OK. <laughs> we want to hear you well. <laughs> I'm just squeezing things through. Like I no, said. It's not on. It's on now. I'm holding far too many things. Should I just try to If you want to use this one, it's okay. Yeah. My name is Hadiza Kiri Abdurrahman. I'm going to present on the state of internationalization of higher education in sub Saharan Africa. I think we've been talking about Zimbabwe, rightfully so, but it's also good to know where Zimbabwe stands. In in terms of what other people are doing. So that was one of the things that we did. Now this paper hasn't been done by me alone, as you can see by the names there. I've also got my senior colleagues, 
um, Evelyn Gary, Isabella, and Juliet. So in a way, I'm the minion. I had to do all the work um, in terms of standing here before you and trying to do something that is quite daunting. Um, so this is where we are at. We're going to look at what happens in other parts. I'm going to start by saying, from what I've had today, Zimbabwe is way ahead from the papers that we've looked at. That we're even here having a workshop shows how much has already been done. And I have a feeling that with time, you're going to be called upon by many of these other African countries to say, come tell us what you've done. All right, I am that kind of teacher that moves around everywhere. I should warn you that I also get very excited as well. Um, yes, so there will be some of the things that have already mentioned, like Sabello talks a lot about it, and you can see that he helped in writing this paper. So there will be overlaps. I was very nervous, like I said, I'm talking coloniality. It's that same thing. As academics, we go on and on and about a particular topic. I honestly don't think we can overflow it. Especially as formerly colonized people, it needs to be at the forefront of everything that we do. So when we introduce it as an additional lens, it's because even though Sabrina says we need to keep our feet on the ground, we need to go into this with both eyes wide open, we also need to acknowledge that our vision has been corrupted, that what we see has been conditioned by something else. So in a way, we need coloniality as an additional lens with which to view every single process that we undertake. So that's what we did when we got hold of this. So um, it's very clear, internationalization has emerged as one of the most significant areas of change. It's almost like you internationalize or you perish. There's no choice now, you need to internationalize. But how do you do this? That's the question. Um, so what we've done, given the six different contexts, was to try and tease out what's happening in other places, try and synthesize them, and then just to paint a picture of what's happening across Sub-Saharan Africa. We did this because we wanted to see emerging themes, we wanted to see what gaps were there, and we wanted to use it so that it would be useful for benchmarking, so that Africa, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia. Um, I have to start by saying, Everyone seems to be connected to Professor Weber except me. I feel left out. So I'm glad that I'm connected to you through other people. But on the good side, having mentioned Nigeria, I know Professor Jimbo told me that he has connections with Nigeria, so I don't feel so left out, so that's good. Um, in many such settings, what we quickly realized was that internationalization was a response to globalization. It was globalization itself was forcing this context to internationalize, it was a response and it almost accelerated it. Now, Vimbo Amaloy said that there are two sides of the same coin, internationalization and globalization, and they share many common characteristics, but they're not the same. What it tends to do is to accelerate internationalization activities. Now, in the interest of using a decolonial lens, wherever you see globalization, it's important that you kind of Enter cautiously. Higher education has become a commodity. And we know what happens when things become commoditized, subject to market economy. What happens in market economies? There are winners and there are losers. And with the historical baggage that contexts such as ours have, where do we fit into this globalized market that higher education has become? Are we playing catch up? What do we do? These are the questions that we're really trying to tease out. Um, so of globalization in particular, you, you know how I said, when you hear globalization, then your blinkers should come on. It should act as some kind of, okay, maybe it's time to take a step back. Rather than embrace it willingly, let's perhaps be a bit more critical. Several warnings of globalization being a new form of imperialism, a form of Western global hegemony, one that subsumes itself politically, economically, socially, culturally, well now, educationally as well, into wherever it finds itself. It fashions things into what it makes wants it to be. Nothing wrong with that, you would say, so long as you are aware. So I suppose my role here is to be that cautious voice as exciting as internationalis internationalization can be, as promising as it is, which it is, we know what our histories are. 
and this is what we must carry along with us moving forward. Um, so, again, Mimba Amoloi argue that Sub-Saharan Africa has long been pressured by neoliberal market economies and government policies into serving their interests before our own. I put myself in the hour. Again, we're constantly reacting rather than being proactive. And this is what makes this gathering really good. It's a proactive. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to harness all the things that need harnessing. So, this is where our decolonial lens comes in handy. The argument is always for a proper understanding of the decolonial in all processes. It's not just educational. Whatever you come to do, this helps you to just see things slightly more clearly. That's the argument we're trying to make. Especially, like I said, as former well, decolonized people. For some of us, it's recent. But even when it's long gone, the impact of it is so in-depth on our subjectivities, on our mindsets, on the way we see the world. As soon as we begin to see that clearly, it helps us in our thinking. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but I like to put it there because when we constantly talk the colonial, the colonial, a lot of people, some people just don't know what we mean. As academics, we like to assume so many things. It's even in the ways that we mention epistemology and ontology, like assuming everyone knows it. The common man on the street just doesn't. It has no relevance to him in that way. So as soon as we begin to break down, okay, epistemology is um, what gives you the, your claim to knowledge and ontology is the way you see the world. I just break it down into an English that everyone can understand. And my microphone has gone off. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> All right, it's on now, I think. So um, this are the three colonialities. And I follow Professor Savello because he makes sense in the, in the way that he approaches the issue. Now, are there criticisms? There are always criticisms. So, um, these are the three. I won't bother reading it because I kind of know that I, by this time of the afternoon is almost death by PowerPoint. But these are the three. Of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it's back here. Of knowledge especially. How has colonial modernity interfered with our ways of knowing of social meaning making, of imaging and of seeing, so of imagining and of seeing. So if you work on that premise, then you begin to see that even the sitting and the drafting of this policy is not without bias, is not, it's also implicated in the very process. That what we come along with is our conditioning, is the way we see the world. So the, the Solutions that we prefer will also be based on that. Now when we begin to kind of explore it in deeper details, then we can see that. Um, hegemonic power, there is a global asymmetrical power relationship. Let's not kid ourselves. Africa has always kind of lower down the food chain. And that's the honest to God truth. So if we're talking internationalization, who are we competing with? What are the nations that we're competing with? We have to be realistic about this. How do we compete in a way that also takes into cognizance these, this global asymmetry of power? Um, and of being, Western epistemologists still dominate, whether we like it or not. If someone stands before you and says, I have a degree from Oxford, you're going to pay attention. If I stand before you with a doctor in, my, in front of my name, I'm like, oh. So it's there, it's, let's, be honest enough to say, okay, it's always going to be there. How do we take advantage? How do we subvert what exists to the end that we want it to? That's what we're seeing here. It's already, the game is already set. How do we become better players of that game? That's the issues that we're raising here. So um, of the things that we looked at, of the settings, one thing was very clear, and it's what um, Savella says that African institutions are born international. Internationalization isn't new. All of them were born international. It's in their very DNA. So when we say we're internationalization, internationalizing, it's not new. So we have to be careful that we don't give old things new names and then carry on doing things the way we've always done. In a way, because we're born international, that is an advantage. 
It's in the things that we've always done. We kind of almost have played the game already. So we've got experience. Um, it's clear that it's a very complex unfolding issue. Did you see the itemization of the team before me? All the things that have to be done to internationalize. It's a lot for us to get to where we need to get to. But maybe it's not a destination. Maybe it's a journey and one that has to be reactive. Because the world that we inhabit now would not be the same next year or two years. So maybe our job is not to set things in stone. Maybe the job is to constantly think and think, okay, how do we take advantage of this or that? Um, of course, globalization adds to this complexity, especially as an economic phenomenon. Internationalization also appears to be entangled with other intertwined issues and processes, which we need to think through for different contexts. Different areas have different specificities, different histories, different baggages, different strengths, different weaknesses. So it has to be tailored. That's what we found, that of the six regions, there were similarities, but there were clear differences. Um, this complexity has been articulated by Olukoshi and Zeleza, who list 10 items. As if internationalization was not complex and difficult enough, these are some other items for you to have a look at. But when I looked at the policy document, I realized that a lot of it has already been addressed. These are some of them. I'm not going to read them. The slides would be available. But you can see that we have to find a way of balancing, dealing with access and quality, achieving equity, attaining internationalization, while still indigenizing. Um, balancing global presence, what about our local knowledges? It's really a very complex process. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, what these issues tell us is that internationalization has to be pursued while taking into account so many other variables. So many variables. Now when we talk about infrastructure, in some parts of Africa, even having proper internet access, like high-speed internet, could be an impediment. What about research funding? What about things like sanctions? Zimbabwe is doing so well till it fell out of favor and then got lampooned with sanctions I struggled to recover from. What is to say that if you fall out of grace, something else would not happen? Things that are out of our control with the best of intentions. What about global rankings? I know we keep talking about these global rankings. They were not set by us. In many ways, they are not set for us. Again, we are playing to that. It's a game we have to play as games go, so we have to find a way to do better at them. What about visas? Even for academics attending conferences, we went to one recently, most of our colleagues couldn't get visas. So yes, here we are, hunter-gatherers of knowledge. When it comes to time to theorize and rise, we're often not there because of where we are on this global colonial matrix of power. So I'm trying to say, International, not internationalize we must, but let's be careful that we're not romanticizing, that we're remembering the baggages that we bring from the, from the past and which still exist in the present. So it's not a level playing field. In fact, Maringa says, despite the global rhetoric about emerging isomorphism in HE, why disparities continue to exist? which entrench poverty differentials, they've always existed. They've always existed. You need to make collaborations with better institutions because they're there before you and they have more funding and more power and more visibility, everything else that we're trying to achieve. And then what was clear from all the settings was the ad hoc nature to internationalization. There didn't seem to be like a policy document like you're trying to come up with here. A lot of settings just had different things happening in different institutions. And in many cases, some of these institutions were even competing against each other. And so that didn't work for the nation. So that was one of the things that we noticed, a lack of strategic approach, which makes it often accidental and incremental. New forms of power relations. Again, when you think about even in terms of collaborations, or in terms of the possibility of a brain drain. 
or our students still wanting and still looking north. A lot of students still want to go north. It's just the way that we're conditioned. That's where the coloniality comes in. Who doesn't want to go abroad? Uh, and then so, what are the chances of getting people to come the other way? That's maybe where we should be looking at. Um, the possibility of internationalization as a one-sided imposed external practice. So for instance, in the Kenyan setting, one of the concerns that they raised was, are we doing internationalization at the expense of other things? Could the money be used elsewhere? And who measures if these things are working? So this is a cautionary tale. And I think in an afternoon like this, there is room for caution. In a way that, yeah, it might not happen to us, but yeah, who knows, let's at least be aware of it. Um, the Western face of internationalization is something else. We cannot ignore this. And I keep saying to ignore it is at our peril. It's not like we do not know our history. So we cannot say, oh, it can't happen again. Because we just don't know. Um, internationalization remains about student and staff mobility, which looks north for all these reasons. So again, like I mentioned, situated there in the colonial matrix of power, clear that they're having to deal with growing complexities because they're already disadvantaged by historic and structural imbalances. Um, the colonial is highly problematic. What unique demands to be imposed on the agenda? So looked at with the colonial lens, it could be the reason why international internationalization so far has assumed a vertical approach. So, Savello calls this vertical in the terms that it looks upwards. And what he says is, again, what I have seen the Honourable Minister say, facilitating visas, making sure people come from elsewhere, should we be looking horizontally? Should we really, first of all, strengthen what happens in our region, in our continent, in the global south? Should we, is, that, is that something to tap into? Should we reset our default? from always looking north as a prima facie, as a standard, to perhaps looking horizontal first. What was gleaned? Again, no nuanced articulation because African HEIs are born international. We've always done it. it was not, it's not something that, okay, let's have a strategy for until now. So well done, Jizunche, you really done well here. The need for it to be implemented in a strategic way one that takes into issues of not only globalization, but decolonization, the imperialization, and the racialization. Even when we look across regions, it's not that like we're not without without we're not without our problems, even as Africans. So that's something else to think into. What about issues like xenophobia? What about our distrust of each other? All these are baggages. This way we have learned to other from being the other. So this is really deeply philosophical thinking about our subjectivities and the way that we see the world in articulating a process like this. So, um, I should warn that decoloniality is more than just moving from one fundamentalism to another, like Savelle has already said. We are not fixating on decoloniality as a thing. It's an added understanding. And it's not about revenge. It's also not about either or. Because sometimes we mention it and it creates a certain discomfort. Because it, it's, it provides for moments of disconcertment. Because we're all implicated in it. When we talk about this is who we are, this is how we are, you're having to think, oh, am I that way? So it's not about revenge. It's about us knowing what to keep what we find useful, and what to dump. That's what this is really about. So as we have already seen all day, across the region it has several potentials. As a response to marketing opportunities, it has several economic benefits. As a useful tool for growth. Importantly, it can also be a great decolonial tool. If you're thinking, oh, this provides us with an avenue, to rejig our curriculum, to introduce more African knowledges, to look at other sources, other ecologies of knowledge, that's a great moment for moving forward. What about, so when, we're, when it's done with a horizontal approach in mind, 
We imagine a stronger, more efficient, more collaborative Africa if we looked horizontal. In conclusion, 